Since the Earth formed more than three billion years ago, bacteria have been the most successful life form on Earth. Their sheer number has been estimated at five nonillion entities, that is a five followed by 30 zeros. Bacteria have colonized a wide variety of ecological niches, from the permanent ice of the glaciers to the hot springs deep inside the oceans. And they have colonized the human body. The human body comprises two bacterial cells for each human cell. Humans are therefore halopions. Indeed, we cannot live without the bacteria. They are essential for health, and in health, the beneficial bacteria live in balance with the immune system. This is called symbiosis. In the intestines, bacteria make nutrients available to the body and produce vitamins crucial for health. On the skin, they prevent disease-forming bacteria, the pathogens, from colonization and proliferation. This is also true in our oral cavity, where almost 1,000 different bacterial types can colonize. But what happens if the balance between our protective bacteria and our immune system is lost? What if the symbiosis turns into a dysbiosis when disease-forming bacteria emerge? Replacement of a tooth with an implant-supported restoration is associated with the establishment of well-defined peri-implant soft tissue compartments. The epithelial soft tissue attachment to the transmucosal part of the implant and its restoration, the junctional epithelium, incorporates a small area called a peri-implant sulcus. This creates a new habitat for bacteria to colonize. As in the rest of the oral cavity, in health, the bacteria colonizing the peri-implant sulcus are aerobic and faculative gram-positive bacteria, mainly coxy and immobile rods, with only a few anaerobic gram-negative organisms. In symbiosis, the immune defense mechanisms to these bacteria are proportionate and in balance with these organisms. The connective tissue lateral to the junctional epithelium displays no or only minor features of inflammation, and gentle peri-implant probing of a healthy sulcus does not result in bleeding. However, as with natural teeth, if plaque is allowed to accumulate, inflammation of the surrounding soft tissues arises. Most patients with plaque accumulation around their implants develop a so-called peri-implant mucositis. As on all solid liquid interfaces in nature, bacteria accumulate in biofilms on dental implant surfaces once they become exposed to the oral cavity. Not all bacteria are capable of adhesion to surfaces on their own. Some streptococci, however, possess molecules called adhesins that enable them to adhere to the surfaces of teeth and implants. Next, secondary colonizers, such as Fusobacterium nucleatum, can adhere to the structural proteins of the streptococci. This organism has the ability to co-aggregate with a variety of other bacterial species and communicate with them by sending and receiving chemical messages. Fusobacterium thus acts as a mediator to the next wave colonizers, the so-called late colonizers. In addition, Opportunistic pathogens associated with other diseases of the body, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staphylococcus, have also been identified. 
If the rough lower endosis part of the implant become exposed to the oral cavity, the situation intensifies. While roughened surfaces are advantageous for osseointegration, they are also very prone to bacterial colonization once exposed to the oral cavity. Together the bacteria produce large amounts of polysaccharides. Tightly packed and surrounded by a common matrix, they form a robust biofilm, an ecosystem relatively stable within the host. The biofilm protects the constituent microorganisms from chemical and mechanical attacks, as well as from the host's immune challenges. Within the biofilm, the bacteria communicate efficiently. Their communication is based on physical contact, an exchange of metabolites, and the transfer of genetic material. An important part in this respect is quorum sensing. Here the bacteria determine cell densities and ambient conditions in part via messenger substances, for example, the autoinducers. The concentration of these substances in the surrounding medium controls bacterial gene expression and thus influences the individual bacteria as well as group behavior with regard to surface adhesion, polysaccharide production, and the bacteria's resilience and virulence. Production of toxins and other bacterial factors, such as CPG motifs from bacterial DNA and protein antigens, activate the host's immune response. Plaque formation consistently results in inflammation of the peri-implant soft tissues, a stage of the disease called peri-implant mucositis. The clinical sign of peri-implant mucositis is bleeding following gentle probing. Other signs may include redness, edema, and a deepening of the peri-implant probing depth. If peri-implant mucositis is left untreated, the onset of peri-implantitis may occur. There are clinical similarities between peri-implantitis and periodontitis. However, peri-implantitis may progress faster and with more aggressive bone resorption than periodontitis. This may be influenced by several structural differences between periodontal and peri-implant tissues. Dentogingival fibers around teeth connect the soft tissues with the root cementum and are oriented in multiple directions. They separate the periodontitis lesion from the alveolar bone. In contrast, the collagen fibers around an implant are anchored in the crestal bone and extend parallel to the implant surface. These fibers do not act as barrier against spread of inflammation. Periodontal ligament fibers seal the apical part of the sulcus around teeth with a fibrous attachment to the root cementum. They also separate the lesion from the alveolar bone. In contrast, the peri-implant tissue lacks the dentogingival fibers and periodontal ligament. Thus, the peri-implantitis lesion extends close to the crustal bone. Neutrophils occur in much larger numbers in peri-implantitis than in periodontitis and are, together with macrophages, attracted by the buildup of a chemokine gradient. While plasma cells are the dominant cells in both types of lesions, the total number and density of plasma cells is significantly higher in periimplantitis than in periodontitis. Unhindered by the vertically oriented collagen fibers, the mucosal inflammation moves apically and starts to involve the bone. Pro-inflammatory cytokines and other chemical messengers released by the cells of the immune response induce the maturation and activation of osteoclasts, which are responsible for resorbing the bone.
Even the osteoclasts themselves secrete chemokines, interleukins, and other messengers under the increased influence of bacterial antigens, additionally intensifying the inflammation. As a result of all these mechanisms, periimplantitis progress quickly and circumferentially, forming a saucer-type lesion around the implant, thus leading to intra-bony defects. Periimplantitis lesions are usually up to twice as large and more circumferential than periodontis lesions of natural teeth. If left untreated, the damage is often irreversible, and the implant may completely lose integration or require removal. The main goal of treatment of periimplantitis is to resolve the inflammation in order to arrest disease progression and further bone loss. Infection control is achieved by the removal of biofilm from the implant surface using mechanical, chemical, or air polishing methods. With deep peri-implant pockets, a surgical intervention is usually required to gain access to the implant surface for biofilm removal. The surgery may involve resection of the mucosal cuff around the implant for pocket reduction. In some cases, it can be combined with reconstructive procedures. As advanced periimplantitis is difficult to treat, prevention is the priority. Periodic probing to monitor the periimplant conditions ensures that signs of disease such as bleeding and pocket formation are diagnosed as early as possible. A thorough assessment of the patient is also recommended, as other factors such as prior or current periodontal disease, smoking or diabetes may increase the patient's likelihood of developing peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis. Also, local risk factors should be considered. Excess cement, lack of attached soft tissues around the implant, and ledges on crowns that assist biofilm accumulation and inhibited daily removal by the patient. The key for long-term success following treatment of peri-implant mucositis or peri-implantitis is the prevention of recurrent dysbiosis. By establishing shallow peri-implant probing depths, patients can perform adequate biofilm removal using oral hygiene aids on a daily basis. Additionally, regular supportive dental care and professional biofilm management is an essential part of maintenance therapy and highly recommended. If dentists, oral health professionals, and patients work hand-in-hand, -hand, peri-implant mucositis can be diagnosed and treated at an early stage, maintaining the peri-implant health over the long term. We cannot change biology, but we can control risk factors and adapt our therapies.